Hello, welcome back to another video. I am your video host, Big Deno Paints. And in this video, I'm going to focus entirely on painting a face, specifically a female face. And I'm going to treat the commentary on this video as if this is the first video you've ever watched of mine. So I'll focus on probably some things I've already discussed in other videos. So my process is what I like to call sketch and then refine, which means I treat the first coats of paint as very rough and then later smooth them out. And that sums up my process in a nutshell. And so pretty much every part of a model that I paint, I'll use this, but there's different ways that you can refine as you'll see through the course of this video. So <clears throat> I start with a, a prime done from the top with, with, a, with a white light from the top to just better understand the volumes on the model. Some people use this prime, it's called a zenithal prime, to actually then layer translucent coats over the top and use the, the variation in color to create some, some pre-shading. I don't tend to do that as much. I much prefer using that as a guide for where the lights and shadows should fall. It also helps you see the detail of the model a little bit better. So here I've used a Nocturna color called Burned Flesh. And I've done, as you would have seen, two thin coats over the zenithal prime. So at this point, it's important to understand uh, one key thing, and that is the light situation on your model. The Every stage after this, from highlighting, shadows, everything, it's very important to be respectful of where the light source is on your model. And so you would have seen I grabbed a, a the, the torso for the model and just held it up to try and uh, understand where my optimal viewing angle was from. So I think if, if, you, if you have a specific angle that you want people to view your model from, it gives you a bit more freedom to play around with some interesting lighting and shadow effects. So I like to have a pretty clear concept of where I want my light source to come from based on what the viewing angle is. So for this model, she actually has her head turned off to her right shoulder. And rather than have the, the chest be facing front on and have that be the optimal viewing angle, I've decided that the, the, the face will be the key focal point and so it will be viewed from front on uh, respective to her face. And so what that means is I'm doing some pretty stark light transition from one side of the face to the other. But as you'll see, that'll evolve throughout the process. One of the great things about the way that I approach, because everything's done so quickly, it's not too difficult to make a change or try something different throughout your process. So that was a mixture of two colors. It's uh, another Nocturna color called Nocturna Natural Flesh. And then I've also mixed in a scale fantasy color into that mix, which is called Peanut Butter. And those two colors I've then mixed into the reddish flesh for that first layer. This layer that I'm doing now is actually uh, pure peanut butter and natural flesh. So you can see I'm, I'm thinking about each volume and how I think the light source would interact with that volume and specifically you can see that the light is coming from her top right, top left from our viewing angle. But again, this is based on the, the model's positioning. It's quite an interesting head position for a bust. So the, <clears throat> the lighting is 
a little different to how I would normally approach a, a face. But I think you get to see exactly how I go through the process. So this next layer is the peanut butter and natural flesh. And I've gone for a little bit of sunny skin tone mixed in with that to pre really start to isolate where I want the lights. And as you can see, that there's a very stark transition between the lights, the mid-tones and the shadows. And that's, again, part of the process. You don't have to be ultra smooth, even with a female face where you want to have smooth textures. It's all about understanding where the placement of light goes. So going back to the light source, it's the, the very first thing I think about when I look at a figure and how I'm going to paint it. The next thing I think about is how each of the volumes on the model and the, and the term volume basically just means three-dimensional shape. How each of those volumes will interact with light. So with the face, it's generally broken down to a number of spherical objects. So the cheek itself is a sphere. You've then got the nose, which has a sphere on the end of it, but it's somewhat of a rectangular shape prior to that. The chin's slightly rectangular, although for female faces, it tends to be a little bit rounder, so more spherical. And so the way that you highlight those objects is relative to the shape that they represent. And so even though a traditional way of lighting an object when you're painting miniatures is from the top, by considering how the light would interact with the surface as a, as a volume, as a shape, can sometimes prove to have some interesting differences to the normal approach of a 28mm model, for example. Uh, so that was sunny skin tone, pure sunny skin tone, and here I'm doing some very bright lights with ivory. And once again, I'm just really focused on where is the light source, how would this surface react to that light, and I'm, I'm really trying hard here to create a high level of contrast. So the term contrast has an, a number of different applications. The, the dictionary definition of contrast is a juxtaposition of strikingly different elements. When painters, miniature painters, refer to contrast, generally they're referring to value contrast. So value meaning the difference between light and dark. And so when they say you need more contrast, they're usually meaning you need to have a bigger change from light to dark. So this close-up is really useful to see just how non-smooth this first stage is. And we're going to work and refine that uh, very soon. This is all at full at normal speed, although I have cut out a few small sections of me talking to someone who was sitting beside me. Uh, this part I'm not going to talk too much on. This is a secondary light source, which is probably not appropriate for this, but because someone else was painting a model alongside me and they were taking a long time, I had to amuse myself with something. So thanks, Gav. So going back to value contrast. So one of the best ways to explain value is to think of everything on a, on a scale. So if you have the very darkest color possible, so black, at the lowest part of the scale, so one or zero, and you have white, which is the highest value color, the brightest color, as 10, all of the sections on your model can actually be plotted on this, this value scale to give you an understanding of where the focus of the model is. So for the face, given that it's your focal point where you want your viewer to be drawn to, it's very common to have the face be the highest value part on the model. So even though your skin tone is usually quite quite light, by making the skin even lighter, it helps to draw the, the viewer's gaze to the face. So here we, we've transitioned over to the airbrush, and this is the first part of the refining process. So you can see from the cup there that the, the paint is 
fairly dilute. And the colour that I've mixed here is a mixture of the basic skin tone that I created, so peanut butter and natural flesh, and quite a lot of thinner, and also a tiny touch of the sunny skin tone. So it's a slightly lighter mid-tone. And you can see where I'm angling the airbrush is very, very considered. It's where the join is between the two colors, the, the dark and the shadow. By aiming it at that spot, what you're doing is you're, you're putting lots of small dots of paint onto the, the line between those two. And because the paint's tiny little dots, what it's doing is it's effectively tricking your eye into thinking that there's a smooth transition there. So sometimes this takes a few coats, but the best way to understand this is think about newspaper pictures and how if you look very, very closely, it's lots and lots of small dots. This is effectively what an airbrush is doing. It's just tricking your eye into seeing a smooth transition because you're so far away from those small, small dots. So the next stage that I'm doing is uh, a little bit more of the high value skin tone. So I've added a little touch more sunny skin tone. And you can see that time I was focused a lot more on the lights. And so what the airbrush is doing is it's creating a filter over the skin, the, the high value and the low value. And so that's having two, two effects. What it's doing is it's reducing the contrast from, from the white down back towards the mid-tone, but it's also bringing the contrast of the dark area, the dark skin tone, up towards the mid-tone as well. So it's actually having the effect of reducing the contrast between those two elements. And that's why the first stages of what I did looked a little bit over-contrasted, had a lot of discrepancy between the two colors because coming to this stage, as you can see, we're bringing all of those colors together. So the skin lights were effectively a eight or a nine, whereas the shadows were probably a two or a three. But by using the airbrush and doing this, this refining stage, it's brought the skin's lights probably down to a seven and the shadows up to a four. So here I'm going to use a bit more of a glaze. You can see again in the cup there, the, the consistency is quite dilute. And this is a mixture of orange and scarlet. The reason for this is, is something to do with saturation, and I'll talk about that in a little, a little bit. But I wanted to add more color to the skin. The, the skin tone had become quite pallid and pale. So by adding some more color, specifically targeted at the shadows, but also heading up into where the cheeks uh, are more rounded. There's a little bit more color in there. It's just adding a little bit more life to the skin. I actually didn't get the dilution perfect here. And if you look very closely, you can actually see some, some watermarks where I've gone a little bit too heavy on the air. So the good news is you can always fix this. You can always fix everything. And, and what I'm about to do now is fix that mistake with a little bit more mid-tone brought back. So you can still see that orange color in the skin. And you can see how this several quick layers of this light skin tone is just bringing that smoothness back to the skin where there was a little bit of a line there from the mess up. So at this point, I'll just touch on saturation. And so saturation is basically how powerful and intense a color is versus how much gray it has in it. Uh, in case you're wondering what I'm doing here, this is actually a, a varnish, an AK Interactive matte varnish, and I'm using a hairdryer to dry that out. So that's just to bring all the colors, which are from a variety of different manufacturers, 
to have the same reflective surface. I think I actually also added just a tiny touch of that uh, peanut butter into the varnish mixture just to filter over the whole skin tone. Anyway, to go back to saturation, sorry, I forgot that I did that, so that's important. Um, so saturation is how much gray a color has. And so one of the most important, I guess, revelations I had as a painter was that I re realized that when you mix in white or black into a color, you are effectively mixing in a gray, which is desaturating the color. This is the varnish stage here. So when you use an a highlight with a white or an ivory or a cream color mixed into your skin tone, you're actually having the effect of desaturating it. And so it's making the color less vibrant and less powerful. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just something that you have to be aware of because saturation versus desaturation is another lever that you can use when it comes to creating contrast. So you don't just have value contrast between light and dark, you can also have saturation contrast where you have saturated colors beside grayer colors and you can also have a variety of other contrasts which I'll talk about later on. So this matte varnish, I ended up mixing a little bit more in my cup, which is why I did two coats, no reason other than that. And so this here is the skin tone that I'm working with. It's a, this is a little bit more of the secondary light, which is, again, not really relevant for this particular topic. So this isn't the final stage, and this is one of the advantages of the technique. So this is real time. So as you can see, we've spent about 16, 17 minutes so far on this face. But we can go back and repeat parts of that process very, very quickly and very easily, which will allow us to add more contrast or more saturation or less saturation very, very quickly, and then use either the airbrush with more glazes or similar to the approach that I used before, which I wouldn't necessarily call a glaze. Or we can also do it with a brush and you will see that I do some smoothing with a brush later as well. But you can see already that, that most of that sketchy roughness has already disappeared from the model. And that was partly the, the strength of the airbrush, but I probably could have replicated that process a similar speed without using the airbrush. So I do like the airbrush specifically for female faces as they, they really are often a lot of smooth volumes and the airbrush is very easy to create that smoothness very quickly. So going back to saturation by just putting a little layer of the peanut butter over the skin tone, even though we'd already had lights very, very bright, because we'd taken it up to a white or an ivory color, it had the effect of desaturating the skin tone. And by mixing a little dilute filter of that peanut butter, which is quite a rich orange color, it actually brings back the power of the color without necessarily reducing or removing all of the contrast. Very, very dilute. And you'll see I use this trick again a little bit later on to bring back more of the power of the color and create a little bit more saturation. So another important thing that I, I always recommend is understanding how surfaces interact with each other. And this is a great example here. So. Prior to painting the hair, this skin tone looked very, very light and possibly not saturated enough. But it was a bit of an optical illusion because the hair, which was still the zenithal prime from the first stage of painting, was such a high value, so bright, it was actually changing the way that you viewed the skin. And that's a fantastic example of how you can use contrast 
to draw gaze or change the way things look. So by making that hair a darker color, even though it's still quite a light pink at this stage, what that's done is it's made the skin look much higher value, much richer, even though I've done nothing to the actual skin tone. So that's one way to use contrast is to use it to further reinforce a specific area and have it look like a higher value, even though it's the same value, making it look higher by using darker colors around it. So when we talk about value contrast, it's not just within a single volume where you go from light to dark, but it's also the interplay between all of the volumes on the model and having dark colors beside light colors and vice versa, or using all light colors in a specific area because that's the area you want people to be drawn to first. So just very briefly on the hair, I used a technique called wet in wet. It's actually more of an oil technique given that oils have quite a long drying time. It does work with acrylics. I use a medium, which is a, an extender. It adds a little bit of drying time to the acrylics and allows you to manipulate them on the model. It does still only give you probably a minute or two, and it can sometimes give you a slightly reflective finish, but it allows you to just push and pull colors on the model very, very quickly. And I really like this technique for hair and for things like fur, which tend to have very natural variations within the colors that you see. And so the wet in wet tends to help you get that natural variation without really having to do too much work. Again, this is, this is a repetition of the, the same concept with the skin. I'm using a, a sketch here that's placing the lights where I want them and then I'm going to go back in and refine that later on. Now with this particular lighting, again, if you look at how I've highlighted this hair, hair is a surface that has a highlight quite similar to non-metallic metal. It's dependent on where the viewer is as to where the light is coming from a reflective perspective. So, oh, that's a weird way of saying that. Reflective perspective, great stuff. So the reason that the light is there and not on the top of the model is very much related to where the light source is. So again, if you look at the lighting that I've done on the face, you can see why I've chosen to place my highlights on that particular spot and also having little to no highlights on the other side of the face. So that's just helping to reinforce that lighting. And again, that's why I go back to the first question you ask yourself, where is the light source? So that that will help you determine your decision. So that's a combination of ivory for that light and the other colors were Vallejo, Game Color, Magenta, I think off the top of my head. Can't quite remember. Might have been a Nocturna color actually. I'll put the paints that I used in the description below if I remember. So this, the reason I'm working on these hair elements here is, is partly because it's important to understand the two colors relative to each other and having a, a better concept of what the hair looks like. But it's also because I'm waiting for the other person who's painting to finish his skin tone. Like a joker. So this light source, secondary light source is going to be slightly blue. All right, so just moving on to the eye sockets and this is another example of exactly what I was talking about there. If you look at the left eye and the right eye and have a look at how vastly different just filling in that space makes the face look. It's just, it's all about how your eyes perceive the lights and the colors on the model. So filling in those eyes, even though I might not necessarily paint the eyes now, just with that dark color, again, just gives you a much better understanding of what the skin tone looks like and what it should look like when your model is finished painting. 
So that colour is a scale fantasy colour called Tindalus Red or Tindalos Red. It's quite a dark but also a little bit saturated red colour. And I'm using that to fill in the lips, to fill in the eye sockets. But I'm also using it to do a little bit of black lining here. So black lining is just drawing a dark line between two surfaces. It just separates the two, gives you a little bit better uh, understanding of those two separate volumes. But it is, it is also something sometimes uh, beginning painters miss out. You do actually have natural light affecting the way that you perceive the model. And so if you have a lighter color underneath what should be a shadow where you haven't quite lined a, a little area, then you will see a little bit of natural light actually catching off that and it will change the way that that area looks. So really important to get underneath in between the lines just to help the actual visual appeal of the model. Probably haven't explained that very well, so I'll come back to that in another video, I think, because that's probably something that needs a little bit more time than I'm giving myself here. So, what I'm doing at this point is actually just putting a little bit more shadow underneath the eyes. So that airbrushing, although it was very good at smoothing the skin, it took away too much of the shadow underneath the eyes under the eyebrows. So just using a very dilute Tindalus red mixed in with the skin tone to create just a, a sharper shadow under the eyes. So common mistake people make when painting eyes is using a bright white for the orbs, the white orbs. Very rarely, if ever, does that look good. And the reason it doesn't ever look good is if you have a look at an actual human eye, the value of the human eye, even though it looks white when we look at it and think about it, is very, very similar to the value of the skin. And so it's very important that you use not a white, but a grey or in my case, I like to use a skin tone mixed in with a little bit of red or a pink color for your eyeballs. So these eyes here are really great for demonstration because they're very large. Not a lot of eyes are this large, but it makes it much easier to demonstrate painting eyes. So I can do quite a few layers on these eyes. So I'm going to actually highlight those white eyes quite a lot. And again, even though this is such a very small area, I'm going to use my same process where I sketch and refine. So I've created a few transitions within the eyes. This is all the way up to pure ivory. This is mostly focused at the top of the eye. There is still a little bit of the transitions at the bottom. But I'm now about to go back down and use a glaze to smooth that out. And it's, it's also really helpful with these sorts of models to use a bit of a wash on the lower half of the eye. So the reason that's really cool is if you look at a human eye, they tend to be quite pink around the lower eyelid. It's quite hard to paint that. And so just using a wash will actually replicate that as the, as the pigment will tend to collect towards that lower eyelid. So doing a, a pinkish reddish wash helps reinforce the right color and give that pink lining around the lower half of the eye. So there you go, that's the first stage of painting the eyes. So the next thing I'm gonna do, I have no idea, I can't remember, so this is exciting for me as well. What do I do next? Let's have a look. Ah yes, we're doing some skin refining. So this is Going back to the skin tone, I probably would have done this before starting on the eyes if I wasn't waiting for someone else so I could demonstrate. But this is using the mid-tone mixed in with a little sunny skin tone. And there's a, a bit of medium in that mix as well. And so what I'm doing here is I'm going back and I'm adding in the lights. 
So the lights are still there and you can still see it, but there's not enough really strong contrast for my paint style. Possibly other people would have stopped there. But for me, I want to have a lot more contrast so that when the model is viewed under normal lighting, not just under a strong painting lamp, when it's viewed under normal lighting, you still have a lot of contrast. This is a particularly helpful technique, I should add, for if you're painting army models for an army because having that high contrast will help the models pop from a table from normal lighting whereas not looking at the model on normal lighting and treating it as just always going to be viewed under the lighting at your painting lamp will give you much duller finish. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually smoothing the transition exactly the same way as I did with an airbrush using a brush. So I firstly started with some fairly dilute paint, placing the lights where I wanted them. And then I watered down that paint a little bit, not a, not a lot. I then unloaded the brush. So you can see the paper towel on the side of this video here. So unloading the brush is a crucial part of pretty much every painting technique that you'll come across. Having too much paint on your brush will prevent you from having any real control. So diluted, same color that I used to create the lights, and then unloaded the brush quite a lot. So the next thing, and this is a critical part of glazing with a brush, is the direction of the stroke. So when you are glazing with a brush, it's important to realize how pigment flows off the brush. So if you were to grab a piece of paper and do some painting with similar consistency paints to what we use here, you'll see two things about how the pigment collects on that paper. The first is the pigment will always collect stronger at the point where you remove your paintbrush from the surface. It's because of the capillary action of the brush, the paint will always have more pigment come out at the end of that process. And so the reason I say the direction of your stroke is important is because if you start from the light area where you've just done the light and drag your brush out into the shadow, what you will have is all of that pigment getting collected in that spot and that's not going to glaze the transition, it's not going to smooth the transition, it's actually going to create streaks and, and problems. But if you go the opposite direction and you start from the shadow and move your brush into the light, then you are going to have that very refined transition. You're replicating that effect of the small dots because the pigment's being dispersed very, very thinly. And it's only where the brush is coming off the model, which is already in the same high value area where the pigment is coming off. So you don't get those problems. Very, very important part of glazing with a brush. And it's once you get it right, you'll find it very, very easy. And you'll, if you watch the way my brush is going, even on little strokes, I'm, I'm pushing towards the light. So that's very, very quickly added that smoothness to those light parts that I put on the model. Very simple, extremely easy to do. The airbrush might be fractionally quicker, but you can get any, a very similar result, if not exactly the same result, without that much more time. So what I've done here is I've gone through a few lighter and lighter transition layers. So we've got effectively a slightly higher value mid-tone and then we're going up to here which is mostly ivory, fairy flesh and sunny skin tone mixed together but because it's so dilute the power of the color is significantly reduced and that's one of the best things of acrylic paints is you can vary the translucency of them either from here where I'm using quite translucent or 
all the way up to a very opaque color by using the paint fairly undiluted. So this is more of the, the mid-tone and you can see here I'm, I'm working the glazes in, just helping create a little bit smoother transitions. I'm also at this point thinking about the lights, have I got it right, do I want to add more light like I've done there, do I want to change the position of the light, you know that's that little area there beside the eye you can see I've added a little bit more light just to help replicate the light source that I want. I'm leaving those lines in, in the neck you probably observe there's some some texture there that's a, a trick I learnt from Mr. Roman Gruber the great man from Russia skin has a lot of interesting textures even a female face has some texture and so I like to see you know lots of little dots and various little textures on there but the neck is one where there's almost always some some lines from the way that we turn our head side to side so leaving those lines on there and even though I'll, I'll smooth that out a little leaving those lines on there will help just create a little bit more realism and texture and visual interest provides a contrast between the smooth surface of the skin and the textured surface of the skin. So there's another contrast between smooth and textured. So you can you can see this is a glaze consistency and the way that I'm using it is just very very soft quick strokes pushing the paint around respecting the direction that I the brush needs to go and just using it to bring those transitions to a smooth finish. So we are about to zoom in on the face. I think that's happening now to do the eyes and you'll get a good look at the skin tone very, very, very close, which is really cool. So make sure you look at, at a micro detail where you'll be able to see the transitions and you'll be able to almost start to see how that those dot effects are replicating smoothness, which is a trick of the eyes. We'll get very, very close. So, as I said at the very start, the very top of the conversation, sketch and refine. And you can see here, this is a stage where I look at the model as a whole I evaluate each section, each volume, and start to think about, well, where do I want to create more light? Where do I want to add some shadow? Where do I want to add some color, some nuance? And how, how easy it is to be able to do that without necessarily needing to go through the traditional layering style of many, many, many layers of super dilute paint. You can still you can still use that technique. That's perfectly valid way of painting, and I think you know there's there's many many painters who've done that for a long time that have shown that the, the extremely high standard of result you can achieve out of that. But for me, I, I want to be enjoying painting lots of different things, different colors, and and so the the time spent on that process is just not not for me uh, so I'm just gonna add a little bit more color to the skin again this is an airbrush thing but this could be done with a brush just as easily so this is a contrast color it's called volupus pink to it's, it's a rich magenta and the reason I've used this color is because the hair is going to be a magenta color just wanted to tie the two together and I'm being very considered here with where I use it. The advantage of using a contrast paint for this type of layer is because it's a transparent color. A normal paint wouldn't necessarily have the same effect. This will just filter over the, the colors and it'll have the effect of softening some of the harsh lines that I've got, but it'll also still have all of the colors underneath coming through. It doesn't change the, the painting underneath. So you can see there I did the 
very very dilute layer on the cheeks the lower half of the cheeks on the neck I put a little bit of that same color on the lower uh, sorry the the eyebrows the lower eye lid that dark shadow I just wanted to add a little bit more pink around there and just underneath the chin as well so it's very very simple to do with an airbrush it's it's a really fun tool to be able to experiment with and I think they're becoming more and more accessible in Australia you can get a decent airbrush and a compressor for about 300 bucks or so so that's an investment but it's it's for something if you're painting a lot of models the time saving you will get out of it in the long term especially if you're doing army painting I think makes it worthwhile so this is ivory straight ivory and this is again the same sketching and refining but this is much more precise work I'm looking very very much around bright spots the area where light reflects human skin is a little bit moist a little bit dewy and so it tends to glisten a little light reflects off it very brightly in a few little spots so that's using ivory and I'll then just do a tiny little bit of glazing to smooth that out So this is a scale 75 model picked up from a Kickstarter actually purchased the model from Andrew Hayden who participated in the Kickstarter and uh, was very generous in donating this, uh, this model to my cause I highly recommend checking out his stream he's been doing some really cool streams recently all right, so we're doing the eyes here. We're, we're going to go zoom in very, very close in a minute. The first stage in doing the eye is painting the iris. So the first iris was easy. I got that one bang on. So to try and make sure I got the second one right, I did it significantly smaller and just referred back to the other one to determine which direction I would increase the diameter of the circle just to try and make sure it's right one very very important thing with eyes and it's 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 something that many painters get wrong and I, even to this day eyes are still one of the trickiest things I do because the two eyes aren't in the same position the position of the irises is different one is slightly further over than the other so anyway you can see on this very very close close up what I'm doing with the eyes but as I said just have a look at the skin and see those skin tones, the textures, and the what looks very, very smooth from very far away. So, the irises were painted in a dark color, and that's a very important first step. We're then creating the lighting in the irises, and this will be the part where you add the color. So, I'm going to do blue eyes. The difficulty in doing eyes is that it's such a tiny 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 thing I mean look at the size of my finger there right you can see how small it is to be able to position your brush in the right spot and get it right that's very very tricky that takes a lot of practice and this is a really super close look it's highlighting all of the flaws and weaknesses in my painting but what I've done firstly is I've put white down the bottom and then I've done a very very thin dilute blue and you can see I've unloaded the brush a lot so that that very dilute blue is only going where I want it and that's having the effect of filtering our eyes and making our eyes look blue the reason I did lots of little textured strokes in the iris is because you know the irises have those those beautiful striations those lines and so that's very very hard to do at a small scale kudos to those who can I just like to put texture in there so it looks like there's some sort of striations in the eye so you can look at the right eye that is absolutely bang on invariably the right eye is always easier to do I don't know why probably because of the angle of the brush if you're a left-hander it's probably the opposite 
Uh, here I'm filling in the pupil with black. I very much recommend Chimera Black for this. It's an extremely powerful color, but it's also very dilute. And so you can get a tiny bit on your brush and it will flow out nice and evenly exactly where you place it. So not perfectly happy with the pupil nor the position of the iris on this side. So I go back in with a little bit of black and uh, fill in that, that stuff just to try and get the position perfect. Never ever feel bad that you need to do eyes several times. It's always probably the trickiest part of a model. Hold your breath. And getting the dilution right of the the paints so they flow out, flow out of the brush smoothly is critical. Unfortunately, in Australia, where it's about a bajillion degrees, it never stays moist on the tip for very long. So this is extremely evident at this tiny, tiny scale. So, uh, but that's that's pretty acceptable. So the stages as I've gone through, uh, dark color in the eye socket, usually red or pink, then lighter colors for the eyeball itself, dark iris, filling in the iris, a highlight on the iris in the bottom part of the iris, pupil in the top right, or whatever direction you want the eyes to be looking. And then the final thing that sells eyes as eyes is this reflective white dot. Once again, just banger on the on the right eye. And what is this? What is this rubbish here? Come on, son, you can do it. Bleh, 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 bleh. Yeah, so that's uh, rubbish. Absolute rubbish. But because it's mostly in the center of the eye, the pupil, it's much easier to fix. So I'm also adding a little line here of white just across the upper half of the eye. And this is again, think of the light source, think of how the eye would be reflecting the light. I like to just put this little line of white, just, just makes the eyes look like they're glistening. And sells, sells the illusion. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty good eye on the right hand side and the left one is a little bit manky but fortunately I am able to fix it relatively quickly. I think part of the reason that I got it wrong was just the angle that I was forced to hold the position of the model at so that it would be viewable on the screen. So another thing that's important about getting eyes to look quite impressive and draw your gaze is making sure that you do a highlight on both the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid. It has the effect of making the contrast between the, the, the dark line of the eye and the cheek or eyelid itself much more noticeable which basically just reinforces the eyes as an important focal point. So by using, you can see a little imperfection in the model there, probably a little bit of paint or something. I try to get rid of that, have no luck. So yeah, by doing that light color on the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid just makes the eyes stand out a little bit more, just reinforces them a little bit better. And here is a very close up example of exactly the glazing technique that I've been talking about with a brush. Very, very easy. You can see how dilute the paint is there. You can see how quickly it's drying. You can go back and forth a couple of times on, a, on an area. I'm also using it to, to do some lines and because of the medium, it's going to dry quite soon. There you go. So that's pretty easy, pretty quick. So I decided because I wanted it to be quite 
tanned that I was going to do another glaze of peanut butter. This is mixed in with Magic Mix, very, very dilute. To be honest, probably didn't need to do this. I think the, the lighting on the model was maybe making it look a little bit brighter than it needed to be. And I probably went slightly heavy handed on this color. But again, with the, with the ability to just be able to go in and tweak and refine and change something, I mean, this is this is not a not an earth-shattering mistake. It's just something that I can then add more and refine more with. So very good. So here's the secondary light. It's going to be slightly bluish, for what it's worth. When I get around to finishing it, this model this model actually isn't finished at the time of me recording this voiceover. So I will have to go back and put some finished photos of it linked somewhere in my channel at some point. So, very good. Um, so at this point, I mean, the face is relatively finished. There's, there's always decisions you can make about when a model's finished or when you can keep working on it. I have a, have a motto that was a, that was a hashtag that went around recently. It's called finished, not perfect. I think unless you're painting for a, a competition or a specific result, that painting for me is all about having fun and relaxing and enjoying what I'm doing. And so I just, I paint until I feel the model is done and then I stop and I start something new. I think it's very important to take learnings from every model that you paint and evolve over time and there are situations when I choose to try and paint something the absolute best I can and, and you know take it a little bit further than I normally would but it's also nice to just be able to paint something enjoy the experience of painting it and decide it's finished when it's finished so I just did a very very thin glaze of scarlet on the face there and here I'm using a little Tinderloose red to just cut that line and uh, put a little bit on the upper lip. The upper lip is in shadow, it's not light like the lower lip. And here is me actually using Volupus Pink to just put a little bit more of the magenta colour in the bottom part of the cheek. Something I did with the airbrush before, and again, you can do with a brush very easily. That was a little bit of feathering there, which is a technique I'll talk about in another video. So these little tweaks that I'm making now, these just little little adjustments, little little nuances of color. This is all really easy, really relaxing, because you're working with super dilute paint. It's very hard to make something irreparable. With a quick brush, you can a quick moist brush, you can you can smooth out something that you got wrong or uh, fix a, an error so it's very relaxing doing this and I think this is a, a stage that will help the final finished product just little little nuances of color little touches of light a little smoothing of transitions a working of, of the various bits and pieces in the model one thing I haven't done, as I said, I haven't finished this model, so I haven't painted the eyebrows of this model. It is actually a vital part of painting female faces and faces in general, but I didn't do it in this video. The only piece of advice I will give is you need to have a piece of a photographic reference or a reference of something because the eyebrows are critical to creating an emotion, an energy and an emotion in the model. And they're very, very 
easy to get wrong. So having a piece of reference material to just refer to, just to get the proportions correct, the where the eyebrow should be thickest, where it should be thinnest, is very, very, very important. I will go back to eyebrows at a later video, but for this one, I didn't even realize I hadn't done them until I finished editing the video. And I shan't be adding more videos to this video. Uh, so what I'm doing here is just, again, I'm waiting for Gav to catch up. He's miles behind at this stage. Uh, I'm just going to work on the hair and I'm going to use a fluorescent color. She's supposed to be sort of a futuristic chick. So I find fluorescent colors have very, very weak pigment. So the, the best application I've found for them is over a white or a very bright light color much like any super dilute pigment colors like yellows. So here I'm going in with ivory. It actually might even be a chimera white. And I'm just creating very, very, very bright spots, which the fluorescent magenta is going to cover over. And it's also going to go over the other areas of the hair, but because it's a weak pigment, it's not going to have the same effect over those areas. So, great shot of the exact positioning of those light highlights too there. So, good work, Deno. Did something right. Even if you forgot eyebrows, you chump. What a chump. So, I use the airbrush for this for the hair, for the magenta. Again, not necessary, but this is one area where the airbrush, I think is very superior with weak pigment colors because you can do many, many, many thin passes and get that intensity of color that you want very quickly, particularly with this, this fluorescent magenta or the you know, yellow. You need to thin it significantly, uh, otherwise you don't get, this is a thing I'll discuss in a second, pans of putty. Uh, if you don't thin it enough, you'll get uh, blocky coverage. So you need to have it very dilute, but that means you have to do you know, probably 30 or 40 passes to get a nice smooth color, which takes a long time, even with a hairdryer. So I find the airbrush for something like this is just, and you'll see as we go on in the last few minutes of this video and smash the hair out, what a breeze it is. Uh, so Panzer Putty, it's, it's got a remarkable consistency. It's, you can see I've held the model to that plinth there with blue tack. This, it's not like blue tack. It looks like blue tack, but it has a really weird consistency. It's not adhesive but it still sticks to things. It will hold its shape for a period of time, but it slowly melts and goops away from things. So here I'm using a, a steel shaper to just push it into the spots and also move it away from the hair a little bit. So this is obviously used for masking off surfaces. Uh, depending on the shape, you know, sometimes you can use masking tape. This stuff's great for more natural surfaces. It's super easy to apply. You peel it off and put it back in your thing afterwards. You don't like have to chuck it out, so it's going to last forever. It's great stuff. So this is magenta, and if you watch here, watch how weak the color is and how many passes I have to do. So that's the first layer there. So the airbrush just allows you to do... Yeah, so I'm using the, the actual straight air from the airbrush there to dry that out before I bring more color in. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And you can see how it's, how it's not even sticking to the pans of putty at all, the paint. It's just beating up on it. Love that stuff. You can do some pretty cool, pretty cool.
pretty cool masking with it. It's not useful for doing tricky masking effects though, because it doesn't doesn't hold its shape forever, and it's sort of this weird amorphous feeling stuff. It's great though. Uh, so here, a bit of hair dryer to dry that off. Again, I've probably done you know four coats so far. The fluorescent colours, there's, there's a few manufacturers making them now. I've got some scale 75 fluorescent colours. I've got Vallejo Model Air fluorescent colours, Vallejo normal paints. They are the absolute strongest saturation you can get. And it's very, very easy to overuse that. As I talked about earlier, if you have too much saturation on your model, then you won't have enough contrast between saturated and desaturated areas. So you have to be pretty careful with using fluorescent colours and how you how you treat them. All right, so this is pretty much the extent of the video. We've only got a couple of minutes left. So all up, this took an hour. I think if I wasn't waiting for someone else, it would have taken me probably... 40 minutes, maybe less. So you can see how quick and easy that process is to deliver a smooth, clean result. Faces are the most fun thing to paint. Always the thing I spend the most time on. They, for females, are smooth and just... You know, when you get when you get it right and you get the lights right and everything looks awesome, it's a very satisfying feeling. So I love painting busts for that very reason. That you get to have an even bigger face to, to paint and work with. So love painting busts. Uh, so here I'm just using the brush to do a couple of quick layers where the airbrush missed as the Panzer Putty application was a little bit Lucy goosey all right uh thank you hope you've enjoyed this video uh lots of videos planned for the future quite enjoying the process it's all about me trying to teach and hopefully expand my own abilities whilst doing so feel free to provide feedback either here on the video i also have instagram big dino paints twitter seal 69 and Facebook, of course. Appreciate all of your comments and hope you have a fantastic day and paint some cool female faces. Big Jenna, out!